you, could I ask you to please remain standing for prayers? Let us pray. Almighty God, the maker and ruler of all things, we humbly beseech you to bless and prosper the people of this borough of Bedcast and Cleveland. Strengthen our commerce, sustain our industry, nourish our agriculture, strengthen and sustain our communities, bless the work of our charities, uphold and support our children, and prosper all places our borough of Redcar and Cleveland may truly be a place where all generations flourish. We ask for this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, in whom we live and move and have our being, bless, we humbly pray, this borough of Redcar and Cleveland, and grant your gifts of wisdom, love and compassion to all our lives may show forth your abundant light and bear your light to all its citizens. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, the commonwealth, and to all peoples unity, peace, and concord, and to us and all God's servants blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and upon your capsule this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I welcome all members to this uh, meeting of the Redcar and Cleveland Borough Council. First item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Uh, can I make apologies for Councillor Alec Brown who's been taken ill unfortunately this morning, uh, Councillor Sue Jeffrey who's in Thailand and Councillor Michael Dick who is in Italy. Um, Councillors Wilson, Dowson and Harding, Mr Mayor, thank you. I think there are, there are apologies from Councillor Graham Jeffrey, Mrs Cooney and Mrs Thrower. Any other apologies? Thank you. There should be green forms on the desks for declarations of interest. Can I invite those members that wish to declare uh, any interests to please complete the green forms? Item three is to confirm the accuracy of the minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of April 2018. Can I move the minutes, Mr. Mayor? Thank you, Councillor Massey. We have a seconder. Second, Dave. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. All in agreement? Yeah. Thank you. Item four to receive announcements from the Mayor, Leader of the Council, and Cabinet members. Uh, I just have uh, a couple of announcements. One's, one is to thank everyone who took part in the investor ceremony on Tuesday for all the hard work of the officers involved, for those people, uh, members and guests who attended. It was a most memorable, enjoyable and unforgettable day. Uh, I just wish to let members know I had my first official engagement this morning, which was to unveil budget carvings at Broughton, and it was a a lovely morning 
The weather could have been better, but the, uh, but the morning itself was excellent. And can I just uh, um, lastly just mention that Councillor Mrs Cooney is not with us today because of the illness of her husband Gerard, uh, who has been uh, took ill last Thursday. Uh, can we wish uh, Mr Cooney all the very best for a speedy recovery? Uh, any announcements from the Leader of the Council, Councillor Massey? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Can I also offer my best wishes to Mr Cooney and Nora as well, um, from I'm sure everyone in this chamber. And can I also offer my congratulations to yourself for being elected as Mayor, and I wish you a very happy and successful year to follow in the footsteps of Karen, who served our borough so well last year. Um, I did tell you this the other night, but I thought I'd say it in public as well. Um, <laughs> The first, I don't have a lot to say, but the main thing to say is apologies from Sue Jeffrey. This is quite a rare occasion that we don't have the leader of the council here, but it is for very good reason. Sue is part of a, a mission, for want of a better term, to Thailand to meet with the Thai banks. Members will be very aware that there have been a number of issues around the land ownership of the former SSI site, and hopefully this trip is one of the first steps to try and get some of those issues resolved so that we can get some large-scale businesses and really see the regeneration of Redcar in Cleveland through those sites. Members will be aware that we've had a lot of success bringing big level businesses into this borough. MGT Power, Sirius Minerals, Peak Resources, the expansion of Semcor, and we hope to see more and more on the SSI site, the former SSI site, through the work of the Combined Authority. Um, the only other couple of things I have to say are around the boundary review. For anyone who was refreshing the page on the 22nd of May, hoping for a resolution, they actually got the date wrong on the website and it is the 5th of June which we will hear back on the final recommendations of the boundary review. Um, scrutiny arrangements I don't want to say too much because I know that I have a question from Council Nightingale later on but just to re-emphasise I know Democratic Services email from the other day that we are looking to maintain the status quo and apologies for any inconvenience caused there. Um, likewise the only final thing I have to say is um, I know that around the council meeting that we discussed last time at the AGM at the AGM, as we were all about to leave, it was discussed that the 2nd of August meeting may pose an issue to some members, uh, particularly members with childcare problems uh, over the summer holidays. Um, in discussion with group leaders, we've agreed that this meeting should be um, removed from the council diary. Uh, this doesn't require the decision of the full council because it's not adding a meeting, it's subtracting one. And in essence, the notice for that meeting will now not be sent out, so there will be no meeting on the 2nd of August. Uh, that's all I have to say, but thank you, Mr Matt. Thank you, Councillor Mossy. Um, announcements from Cabinet members, uh, Councillor Hannaway. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I seem to be standing up uh, at every meeting to announce the latest batch of Ofsted inspections, and I've got two today. Uh, the first one was the short inspection of Archway, our alternative education facility uh, for children who aren't in school that was previously called the OTAS. And the Ofsted inspectors on this occasion said that the school continues to be good. There was a particularly nice comment that there is a strong culture of respect throughout the school and that pupils show this, show this to teachers, visitors and each other. For example, when visitors enter the classroom, the pupils are excited to share their work. Uh, much less positively, unfortunately, uh, I'd like to announce the result of our joint uh, SEND inspection, which covered the health services and the education services and the local authority services available for uh, children with special educational needs. Although the inspectors were very positive about the work that they saw when they went round the various settings, they did decide that these services are not adequate and have given each of the services 70 days to produce a plan of action to, um, to improve these services. Among the things that they've said, uh, they've said that the local leaders lack an understanding of the needs of the children. Uh, and in particular, this is because uh, the data that we would need to do joint commissioning with the South PCCG is not available. We have been asking for it for three years, but so far the CCG has not been able to provide us with that data. Um, among the other points were the large number of school exclusions, particularly from our academies, 
and the rather shocking fact that half of the children who are excluded have special needs. For us, as a local authority, we need to address the inspectors finding that not enough of the parents uh, of these children knew what our local offer was or what its contents were, and that's something uh, we ourselves must address. Uh, there will be more on the implications and the, um, on our, our own action plan in response to this inspection uh, in my annual report in July. Thank you, Councillor Hannaway. Uh, Councillor Walsh, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the members probably have got very fairly generally bored over the years, certainly since uh, I took this post up, with my comments about the need to improve the standing and esteem of social care work in the community and in establishments. Um, and as part of that, I just want to announce that uh, I think members are aware now that we, as a council, in partnership with Rector and Cleveland College, Job Centre Plus, Coast and Country, and a number of local care agencies, we have now developed a Rector and Cleveland Care Academy, which will, be, which will provide free quality training to anybody in the community who wishes to become a prospective care worker, to become employment ready, and to address what we do know to be the skill shortage in that sector. Anybody from the borough who goes on that course and completes it will receive a guaranteed job interview with a local care company. The first Care Academy cohort worked very, very well. It enabled a large number of students to find permanent employment, and we're keen to build on that. So anybody who's interested in a career in care, or if you know constituents or family or youngsters, or if you have contacts in your schools, Anybody over 18 can, can enrol in the Care Academy with the next six weeks session starting in the middle of June. But before that, there is an information session, a drop-in session at Rector and Cleveland College on Monday the 11th of June between 10 o'clock and 11.30. Um, I think uh, issue, I think a uh, poster relating to this has already been sent to members, but I will follow it up with another copy. And hopefully, perhaps you can use that uh, copy in surgeries, waiting rooms, community centres, wherever you are, to actually encourage people to go into a career which, whilst it has had a poor image in the past, is being rapidly, rapidly improved. We certainly have done our part in that in terms of our contract, with contract compliance with care agencies and up in terms and conditions. And this partnership, which will improve employability and, and improve if you like, training in that sector is another part of that overall package. Uh, so as I say, I will make sure that that material is sent around to members within the next few days. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Councillor Courtenay. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, and congratulations on your appointment. Um, I've put out um, a flyer in front of everybody um, for this weekend. Come in, kick off a summer event. Um, the, the lads from Western Super Mayor have um, arrived and uh, are compacting sand as we speak. And all the, the, the sand sculptures this year are going to be on local stories, local red car stories based around the First World War. And you're all welcome to attend. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pay a tribute to one of Cotham's own who sadly passed last Saturday uh, and offer my deepest condolences uh, to his family. Ernie Cross was born in 1933 and was a great ambassador for his hometown, Redcar, and the surrounding borough. <laughs> Through his passion of motorcycle racing, and particularly sand racing, Ernie brought huge crowds to the borough from all over the Northeast and beyond. Sand racing had been a feature on our beaches from as early as 1906, and Ernie's involvement began in 1938 when he was only five years old. Some of you may recall, uh, may recall the motorcycle racing on Cotton Beaches and uh, Saltburn in the 1960s, where Ernie was very much uh, at the forefront of the organization for many years prior. Uh, in later years, the racing went to South Bank and that would later inspire go-karting. Ernie was the uh, organizer behind the Saltburn Hill Climb, of which he worked closely with the uh, council 
and was still organizing this into his 80s. Um, Ernie also assembled the vintage motor cars and motorcycles at numerous events for many, many years across the borough. He was passionate about his hometown. He was a Coltham lad who brought visitors and vibrancy to the town and across other areas of the borough for many years. And I asked his council to recognize his life and his passing and his contribution to the lives of those he touched through his events and his books. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Courtney. With that. He is one of our constituents, and uh, I could say I know him fairly well anyway. Um, he, 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 one of the remarkable things was that he actually produced a book on, the, on Redcar, and it had some amazing <coughs> photographs, including um, a helter skelter and a big wheel and so forth. It, it was quite remarkable to see what actually happened in Redcar uh, in, in those far off days of the. 40s and, and, and the 30s. Um, he was very active in the local community at some stages uh, when he was a little bit younger and uh, he lived on Gypsy Lane, number 9A I think it was. Um, and um, it's a, quite a shock to have heard this. It's the first time I've heard of this and I do really wish, that, I, I'm sure speaking on behalf of the other Ormsby councillors, we do wish to be associated with all the comments that have been made by Councillor Quartermain. Thank you, Councillor Nightingale. We move on to item five. Sorry, uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you for, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, can I endorse the earlier comments about wishing you well in your year of office? Thank you. I wish you well. Thank you very much. Uh, just two, two points, I think. One is to add to the previous speakers, uh, reflections on a man who has given so much uh, to this borough, uh, to Teesside in particular. Saltburn will be lost now without this leader who has over the decades contributed so much to the history of the heritage of motor vehicles in the town. So, I, I add and endorse all that's been said. I think earlier a uh, comment was made about the absence uh, of the uh, leader of the council. It, it's important to reflect that we are part of Tees Valley and the work that is being done in her absence uh, will continue. But it is important to know that all that work is very worthwhile. And it may be of interest to members to know that the delegation led by the mayor of Tees Valley, Ben Houchin, has been successful in negotiating an agreement with the Thai banks. So I would like to say thank you very much to that mayor for all his work, leadership, and endeavor. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. We move on to item five and to receive any announcements from the chief executive. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No announcements today. Uh, item six, to consider questions from the public. We have uh, no notice, uh, so we can pass on to item seven. That's to deal with uh, business remaining from the last council meeting. And it's a report from um, Councillor Brown as the portfolio me member for neighbourhoods. I move a procedural motion at this point, Mr. Mayor. Can I move procedural motion 13, stroke K, that uh, we adjourn the debate? Like, unfortunately, Councillor Brown has contacted me two hours ago. He's very ill. Uh, he's throwing up and he couldn't make it here. And he really wants to be able to present this report. And through no fault of his own, last time around, this report got deferred. It was because the meeting went on too long. Um, and he'd really like to hear your questions. And I think he'd, he'd make a much better fist of it than one of us standing up here and trying to. Councillor Brown knows his portfolio very well. And I would ask for the meeting support to um, support the procedural motion that I've moved that this gets adjourned until the next council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is that agreed? Adjourn it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Item eight is to consider 
degree reports from cabinet members uh, and council committees. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Holloway. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is the report on looked after children and sexual exploitation. Uh, members will see that the numbers of looked after children have increased again. They continue to rise as they do in other authorities, um, which is, uh, as members already know, uh, a very difficult situation, both financially and in human terms. Um, a small number of children, two children have been placed within house foster carers, and four have been placed with their parents. Uh, I wanted to add some information there because it does sound a little bit counter instinctual that uh, a looked after child should be placed with their own parents. So I just wanted to add some information that it is possible that a care order can be made, but that the court can um, <clears throat> order that the child remains at home with their parents. And also this kind of order is becoming more common, as a requirement is now that care proceedings must conclude within 26 weeks, which is a, a very, uh, sometimes a very stiff deadline um, for services to meet. In April, our fostering team, in conjunction with the communi communications team, had an event here at the Heart to launch our new fostering recruitment campaign. And you can see on page 25, one of the posters that we used in the campaign, this one featuring a certain Karen from Mask who has been a foster carer for nine years. The mayor, as she was then, gave a, a speech at the event, and she urged people to consider fostering teenagers and spoke of her own experience uh, of fostering. I spoke about the uh, desire we have to make sure as many of our children as possible are with in-house foster carers, not only because we feel they have a more normal family life, but also because of the high cost of some of the profit-making independent fostering agencies. There's a figure at the bottom of the page there which is quite startling that uh, the number of looked after children has increased by 34% over the last five years in the borough. This month we said farewell to our own adoption team which has moved across to Adoption Tees Valley I can confirm that because they worked outside my office and they've definitely gone somewhere. So we wish them well in the new, new regional adoption service which is about to begin having its matching panels. There have been seven cases transferred to the looked after children's team from the field social work team uh, in this period and we can, there continues to be a drive to ensure that the placements are matched appropriately. There are quite a lot of uh, fostering panel meetings at the moment, more than we've ever had before. We are um, doing well in terms of recruitment in that regard, uh, but it does put quite a lot of strain on the panel to have um, quite a few separate meetings in the same month. Moving on to the education of our looked after children, there's a section there on their personal education plans. And this adds to the information I gave last time about the work of our virtual school head who is responsible for the education of looked after children. And there are some figures there on page 27. And this is his work in judging the, uh, the standard of the personal education plans. So roughly half of them, he said, are good. Um, some of them are below the standard that, he's, that he requires. And a small number he's judged as inadequate. So he's going to visit the educational settings Firstly, to explain to them what a good plan looks like, but also to go back to judge the plans that they've done. In the Leaving Care Service, the first target <coughs> Leaving Care Health drop-in took place in April, and these will continue every month. And although we only have a small number of young people who've gone so far, we, we envisage that this will slowly build as they continue. The drop-ins give advice guidance and support about health-related topics and also uh, for um, training for our, uh, lead, for our care leavers. <coughs> During the last month, one care leaver secured a job as a stock taker, one commenced their health and social care training, and one su successfully passed their level one in maths. 
Moving on to the CSE section. There's quite a lot of information here this time, and the reason for that is that the annual VEMP report had, has just gone to the Safeguarding Children's Board. And so I thought it was a good opportunity to pass on most of the contents of that report to members. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of information about the different aspects of the work of the different VEMPS groups. In 2018, we will be reviewing our child sexual exploitation strategy. Each borough has its own VEMPS practitioners group, and this is a multi-agency forum which cons considers the cases of individual young people. In April, there were 26 young people subject to a VEMPS plan, but the groups actually discussed 136 children. On the next page, members can see that in terms of the, um, the identity of these young people, there are more females than males, and that the age range is spread between 11 and 17. There's also, on page 31, some information about modern-day slavery, and that these cases have increased in the borough to 17, from, sorry, from 17 in 2016 to 36 in 2017. Unfortunately, there have been no successful prosecutions to date. And the remainder of the report is about our CSE media campaigns, including our National CSE Awareness Day, the In the Wrong Hands campaign, and the Say Something If You See It campaign. Finally, only 46 of our taxi drivers haven't completed the CSE awareness course. One of them is a fellow market stall director um, on the, uh, the farmer's market. I asked him if he'd done it a few weeks ago. He said he hadn't yet, but he knew he had to do it by June. I can't say he looked thrilled at the prospect, but he said he would definitely get it done. Thank you, Councillor Hannaway. Councillor King. Oh, sorry, could I ask if the, uh, that report is seconded? Well, Mr. Mass. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Councillor King. Thank you. Um, just uh, one comment, and if it's all right with Councillor Hannaway, just a little update on the Looked After Care conference that I attended yesterday. Um, I remember last time I sat here, uh, we were looking at over 50% going to ICAS, which was a, a rather worrying thing, so I'd like to commend the team at 61.8% in in-house team. Although the numbers have increased massively, it's taken a lot of hard work um, for the recruitment and retention to get to that level, and it's, it's something 100% would be fantastic. Um, last month I mentioned that a former foster child had been offered a job with Ralph Lauren, but she couldn't afford to go. Update on that is he's now offered a six months paid job in London and two and a half years paid in New York. So I won't be fundraising, but I'm absolutely delighted that that's happened. Uh, yesterday I attended the North East Raising Aspiration Partnership. Um, I did the mental health early identification and the multi agency working to create educational opportunities, training courses. Both went really well, and we then spent an hour with the children. Um, talking about them. Things they came up with were we'd like <coughs> our own luggage and there was lots of other things that I'd like to bring to the corporate parenting board. Uh, good news was whilst I was there I managed to poach two foster carers from other local authorities so I'll be contacting the team <laughs> to see about getting that done. Um, so uh, and uh, there was an, another few ideas about retention of foster carers maybe not on the same registration that there were but maybe as you know like army reserves when you leave the army you go onto a reserve list so you might not be able to foster full time but you could be there and still left as a registered foster carer and that's something again I'll bring to the corporate parenting board thank you thank you councillor king councillor holyoke thank you mr mayor uh, it's just really a point of clarification please if that's okay with councillor hannaway on 215 when you say about this four PEPs are currently assessed as inadequate, is that because they're inadequate when they were first written? Or did they become ina inadequate because of the children's change of circumstances? Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hurley. Councillor Watts, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Hannaway, until recently, I have continually complained about the lack of detail 
and cross things in your reports to this council. I must say things have improved last time and again today. But they still have a great deal of, haven't we had a good time? There's still something significant missing. Some months ago, <coughs> Red Car and Cleveland Children's Family Service were inspected by Ofsted and were judged to require improvement. They made 13 representations. Um, I understand that Red Car and Cleveland appealed against this um, qualification. Um, but the appeal, to the greater extent, has been turned down. Until today, I notice the report you've submitted today, there are some of those recommendations have actually appeared in here. But at no time have you reported directly to this council. And these are significant complaints or issues raised by Ofsted. They start at the top with management and control. They work their way down through fostering, uh, adoption, assessments, assessment of risk, assessment of children in need, assessments before families are placed, children have returned to families, which you've just said is a very difficult process and can be quite dangerous. Um, I think reading it is a very sad picture of every single area it needs improvement. Now, at no time have you come and said what you're actually doing until today. I hear what you're saying, we're getting a report next month. But I think we, we did deserve an ongoing report. The Children and Services represent Red Car and Cleveland Council wider afield. And we need to know what you're doing to address these problems. Thank you, Councillor Watts. Councillor Ian Jeffrey, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, nobody thus far seems to have commented on the inexorable rise of the number of young people coming into care in this authority, which, as Craig says in his report, stands at 283, which is an unprecedented number. I was going to make the point that he did that 34% increase has occurred in uh, the last five years. And Craig pointed out to us, I think, at an earlier meeting, that the situation in Redcar and Cleveland now is that one in every hundred <coughs> children in this authority is actually in the care of a local authority, which I would suggest is an absolutely appalling situation. We know we're doing well in terms of looking after children in care, but it's no substitute for a normal home environment. And whilst there's plenty of detail in Craig's report, and this isn't um, a criticism, it seems to me we have to understand why this is happening. We know that uh, domestic violence, for instance, features in the background of many children that come in care, into care. And we also know in terms of abuse of children, neglect is the one category that most children fall into before the local authority gets involved in their situation. So what's doing it? I mean, my view is perfectly clear. After eight years of this government and its so-called policy of austerity, which is clamping down hard on working people and their families, it's inevitable that these sorts of things are going to happen. And what contribution is the government making to address these issues and to see that successive numbers of children and increasing numbers of children don't come into care? Because as the Association of Directors of Children's Services report pointed out to us last October, since 2010, 1,200 children's centres have closed, which when they were around gave support and encouragement to families struggling to raise their children. And what contribution has the government suggested it might make in recent terms, times uh, towards the well-being and development of children? A £50 million sum of money to further develop grammar schools. If this, as if that is a priority and indeed is resisted by some of the, the government's own members. A TUC report published this week pointed out that child poverty in working families, not families dependent on benefits, was 2.1 million in 2010. It's anticipated it will be 3.1 million this year 
which is a 50% increase over that period of time. And the Trussell Trust, which as many of you will know, administers the network of food banks up and down the countries, country, had 1.3 million referrals into its services last year. And when I was in my, one of my two food banks, in my ward uh, last, last week, the workers there, who are wholly based in churches, the workers there made the point that the sanctions for benefits was the main driver in sending people into food banks. I mean, I think it's a disgrace that there's a food bank network in this country anyway in the 21st century with the sixth biggest economy in the world. But there you are. Uh, that's what we've got. They also told me that many people in South Bank that have to go to the food bank prefer to go to the Grangetown food bank because they feel stigmatised making those approaches in their own community. Fine situation to be in. But there's worse to come, of course, because the Trussell Trust, in terms of their analysis, demonstrate there was a 56% increase in referrals to food banks nationally in areas, in areas where universal credit has already been rolled out. And guess what? In November of this year, universal credit will be fully rolled out in this authority area. So don't look for any great improvements anytime soon. And if Councillor Watts wants some statistics, and if the local Tory MP wants some statistics for their forthcoming newsletters, perhaps they can use some of these. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Councillor Hannaway. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Thank you for those uh, comments and that update, Councillor King. Please keep the ideas coming. Um, because I think you, you, you've broke some very, very good ideas there. Um, and also thank you for your role as poacher. That, that, that's a, that's a, very useful, a very useful role. Um, and of course is why uh, we wanted to, to feature you uh, so much in the Boston campaign, because um, your experience, the combination of things that, that you are, is, is, um, is a very valuable thing for us to have in, in, in our um, recruitment of foster carers. Um, Councillor Watts, when, when you say that the report has a tone of, of have we had a good time, I've just been thinking about that, and it's interesting. I think there is a dilemma sometimes um, in children's services, probably a dilemma that might be shared by perhaps by the police or by some members of the armed forces, is that you want to report on the experiences, you want to tell members what they need to know, you don't want to horrify them. Obviously, you will know, as well as everyone else, that what lies behind a report on fostering children is a, is a huge amount of, of human misery uh, and, and pain. And I suppose there, there is um, only a certain extent to which one can um, speak of that in public without simply um, you know, overwhelming um, members. Uh, one wants to try and give an understanding of what's happening. Perhaps sometimes there is, in the tone of the officers who write the report, um, a, a certain attempt to keep themselves going through humour, um, keep themselves buoyant. Um, but that's something I think we'll have to think about. If you feel that um, perhaps that's interfering with the nature of the information we give, I think I'll take that back and we'll have a think about that. Um, in terms of the, the Ofsted report, obviously this, this is a report, the reports that I give are specifically about looked after children, the Ofsted report covered the whole of children's services. Um, in my report in the past I've talked about, for example, the work we're doing uh, in collaboration with North Yorkshire Council on our front door arrangements, and obviously that was uh, an important part of the Ofsted report. So I've spoken about that. The improvement journey overall, which is um, our response to the Ofsted report, has come annually as a report to Cabinet. So the details on the improvements uh, are contained within there. Um, and also, there'll be information on that improvement journey in my annual report as well. 
Thank you, Councillor Hannaway. Can we agree Councillor Hannaway's report, please? Okay. Thank you very much. The next item is to receive reports and report from the Director of Economic Growth on the adoption of the Red Car and Cleveland Local Plan. Uh, Councillor Norton, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and can I add my name to that august list of people who have congratulated you on your uh, position uh, in the high office of this authority? Well, Mr Mayor, it's been a long time in the making, a long time in coming, but yes, it's here, the new Redcar and Cleveland local plan. Following rejection of the local plan by the then council of the day, Officers immediately set about building and developing a new plan. In the interim, this borough has been subject to predatory developers who, having had their planning applications turned down by this council, went on to mount successful appeals through the offices of the Government Planning Inspector. Thus, a single individual with absolutely no ties to this area, determine the landscape of our borough. So much then for the 2010 Localism Act, and I quote the words of the then Minister for Decentralisation, Greg Clark, himself a former local lad, when he said that the Act would bring about reform to make the planning system more democratic and more effective cold comfort to those local people who fought so well to retain the build and character of their district as they would have wanted it. In the development of the local plan, officers were guided in this matter by members of this chamber through a cross-party steering group under the chair of my uh, then cabinet colleague, Councillor Quigley. There followed the rigorous consultation that is required in these matters involving individual councillors, local businesses, housing developers and members of various national and local bodies. A lengthy and detailed examination in public, chaired by a government inspector, then ensued. Legal opinion was very much in question, uh, sorry, in evidence throughout the, well, and question throughout the public examination process and gave significant gravitas to the process and outcomes that appear in our local plan today. It is worthy of note that after the uh, process, most of the local plan policies previously agreed by members remained unchanged. And I illustrate this with a couple of examples. No changes to key provisions of spatial uh, distribution of development. No changes to the plan's overarching housing requirements. No need uh, to allocate sites for additional housing. The new local plan, our local plan, sets out the benchmark for development within the borough and puts developers on notice that this council will defend rigorously its position as per the local plan and not accept planning applications that do not fall within the framework of it. As well as the local plan, I ask members to uh, adopt the South Tees Area Supplementary Planning Document. The creation of the South Tees Development Corporation, which aims to secure some 20,000 jobs, has Redcar and Cleveland as its local planning authority. This council agreed with the STDC to produce a supplementary planning document for the South Tees Area as a separate document to the South Tees Master Plan the purpose of which was to facilitate focus upon the key planning elements of strategy, for strategy of this area. The SPD does, however, complement the local plan. It's not in place of or in lieu of, adding further detail to the local plan policies and providing guidance on specific issues. The SPD was itself subject to statutory and public consultation but not, as with the local plan, subject 
for examination by the planning expect inspectorate. Mr. Mayor, I'll take questions on the local plan before I uh, sum up, if I may. Thank you, Councillor Norton. Do we have a second, please? Could I second that, Mr. Mayor, and just speak very briefly now to say um, my sincere thanks to Councillor Norton, who I know has a great reputation on both sides of this chamber and has done an incredible job getting it to this point, but not forgetting also Councillor Quigley's work when he had that portfolio at the start of this new process since the failure of the last local plan. I think that through the work of our officers, which has been sterling, our cabinet members, and the cross-party steering group, which Councillor Norton highlighted, we've got a local plan that fits our borough very well, and it gives us the perfect opportunity to safeguard future developments, to make sure that developments in this borough are now appropriate to the shape, size, and appearance of the borough. And I thank everybody that's been involved, and I commend the report to you. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Uh, Deputy Mayor, Councillor... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I say I agree 100% with what Councillor Massey has said, and that we should now be looking forward and making a success of this. But I'm sorry, I've got to take up one or two points. As a person who voted against the original local plan, I'm not frightened to admit it. I think it was justified. I must take up cross swords with my old pal. Councillor Norton. Uh, I, I think at the time, mem members and our non Labour members, I should I'll call them, felt that this was an officer's plan, that there hadn't been enough injection and uh, cooperation with members in creating it. And as I've said before, when it was thrown out, one of a very senior office, planning officer of this council said, you were right to throw it out, it wasn't fit for purpose. And, and I, I, I feel and still believe that if that original local plan had gone through, it, w it, it, wouldn't, it, it would have not given this borough or its residents the protection uh, from exploitation which they deserve. And so I feel that in the, in the long run, although it's been an arduous process, it was the right thing to do. And I think we'll have a better future because members have been heavily involved this time and have seen this thing through in partnership with our officers from beginning to end. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Councillor Glyn Nightingale, please. Uh, th thank you, Mr Mayor, and uh, also um, I'm very glad to see you in that position. Um, can, can I just um, mention one or two facts about the... First of all, I want to associate myself with some of the points that were made by, by Councillor Norton, uh, but I think we should get the clear, clearly the facts about the rejection of the original plan that was put forward. Um, th this is because uh, it was precisely the sites that were uh, subject subsequently to appeal that went through that we were against when we voted against it. So uh, we can't accept the blame for uh, the subsequent uh, uh, appeals being successful in those areas. Uh, on, I, I do wish to associate my, uh, with Councillor Norton on, my, uh, on criticisms of the planning procedures. Uh, I've got 40 years of opposition to uh, what's been going on in planning, particularly in the post-war period where you get uh, crap architecture, uh, um, buildings that are totally inappropriate for the area to be allowed to go through. Um, I, I taught, uh, every, every school building I taught in, which was built in the post-war period, has been demolished, which is a, a, an indictment of the um, public sector and its architecture. Um, uh, and I want to now place the blame for what is actually happening now on the current government, which I think I described as the worst government in uh, living memory as far as I'm concerned. And it was illustrated by the five days that we spent at the appeal, uh, and, and Councillor Lanigan was there, and I was very grateful for attendance, um, on, on the Long Bank Farm uh, um, appeal, which was uh, conducted by someone from Lincolnshire. Um, it was full of technicalities. Um, there was uh, no planning officer there from the council to support 
the um, opposition that was put forward in by the by the regulatory committee. Uh, just as an illustration, we spent six hours with two experts on economics debating uh, the uh, economic situation in in the borough. But there was no mention of uh, the local economy, in particular SSI, which had just been uh, closed. There was nothing about the fall in population that had occurred in the previous uh, uh, period of the census. There was nothing about the projected fall in population. And at the end of this process, these two experts produced uh, uh, evidence that there would be something like, one of them said, uh, something like 29 jobs being created over the next, uh, each year. And another, the other one for the developer produced some, uh, it was wrong way around, sorry. The developer produced the 29 uh, figure and the uh, uh, economist for the council produced something like 109. But in the end, they said, well, it doesn't really matter. They're, they're about the same, so why have we been arguing for, for six hours? It just illustrates how uh, ineffective and inappropriate the planning regulation really is and the planning process. It is time for reform, and we need a greater element of local control. We need real planning, not just ticking boxes, uh, and we need some sort of change in government to ensure that this takes place. And we also need uh, to ensure that those people who are detrimentally affected by planning are compensated, uh, and, and this is certainly not happening at the moment. Uh, of course, uh, I've, I've no faith actually in, in this current government actually doing anything about this. It's too, it's too London-centric, it's too much determining policy on the basis of what goes on in the South. So until we get there, we're going to be put up, we're going to have to put up with some of these appalling situations in planning. Uh, and I'm, I, I can't help but be pessimistic about the future. Thank you, Councillor Nightingale. Councillor Walsh, please. Thanks very much. I mean, there, there seems to be a, a large amount of uh, rewriting history going on at the moment. And, you know, I have to say, you know, this use of a, a phrase attributed to an officer keeps recurring like a hoary urban myth, but we'll leave that to one side. I think the main issue in this document, and the, the one I'd like to indeed uh, lead on here, is the issue of something which wouldn't have been in the last local plan, because it hadn't yet happened, and that was the issues of SSI. We're now faced with, obviously, one of the, perhaps one of the greatest and biggest regeneration projects facing Teesside, probably since the last century. And it is actually one of the, probably one of the largest regeneration projects in Western Europe. And I think it's absolutely crucial that we get this one right, because I think what we had when we saw the steel industry go, when we saw the loss of the Radka works, when we saw the loss of the Lacrimi works, for many of us, including myself, it was almost taken a bit out of your body because you had actually spent a time in that industry. It became an organic part of you and to lose it wasn't just a issue of, let's say, a warehouse closing. It was part of your community, part of our community, part of your life. And it means that in terms of what we use that land for now is of crucial importance to the life chances and opportunities of generations that come after us. And one thing I'm particularly pleased about in, in this is that we are talking about a supplementary planning document which will allow lo the local planning authority, that is you and I, to actually have our say in the forms of built development on that site and to regulate that development in the interests of the community. And what I'd like to do, and I think there's one or two people here who share my memories, to compare and contrast that with the uh, position we found ourselves in the 1980s, where when we had a self-imposed urban development corporation foisted on us by Mrs. Thatcher, foisted on us after a walk in the, uh, the w a walk in the wilderness, and one that brought forms of development to this area which frankly weren't needed. It took a genius, didn't it, to actually build an out-of-town shopping centre half a mile from a bustling high street in Stockton. It took a genius to actually utilise land in and around Middlesbrough Dock, heavily contaminated, to try and bring in uh, leisure activities. 
it perhaps took a genius, did it not, to be looking at issues of heightening the tees to make it more attractive to a yachting club. It took genius for that kind of work to be done and it was done behind closed doors when the developer, which was the D Urban Development Corporation and the planner were the same people. The person who on the Monday talked with developers was the person who on Friday signed off the planning application. That is something we had to suffer, something we went through, something many of us fought against, but at the very least that's not happened now and I think that is actually something we've got to be very pleased of and all praise to those people who fought that battle. Uh, a lot of people also mention those people who were involved in work on the local plan and perhaps one name that has been forgotten, I think we should give credit to him, is Alex Conti, who did a lot of work with us as an officer in developing the plan and working out and tweaking those particular parts of the local plan which could cause issues in individual communities. But, you know, as Bob has said, you know, I'd like to endorse this plan, welcome it, and let's see it as a step forward in building a Teesside fit for the 21st century. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Councillor Eyre, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. It's been said there that uh, the last one, I think it was in 2015, and I'll stand corrected if I'm wrong on that, but I know I'm wrong about that either, uh, that the previous proposed local plan was voted out there because of a lack of consultation. My opinion, that is a matter of opinion. Again, my opinion, it was blown out there because the opposition just wanted to vote against the then Labour administration. And it was all based around one former, former councillor who, was, who, who took a, a particular interest uh, on a housing development proposed there, there within his ward. And the rest of the opposition supported them on that. Uh, whether it was the right or the wrong to blow the uh, previous proposed local plan is a matter of debate. However, having said that, I think it's a it's a true fact that over over the recent year or so, they're the two biggest housing developments in living memory, the Long Bank and the Flats Lane development. It may not have been the easy ride there that the developers had, even though it was refused by the our planning committee. There was thought there at the back of our minds, although it may not be being said, that on appeal those applications would have been turned over in which is the way. And now we've got the 700, nine and 800 houses up on the Long Bank and the Flats Lane. If, uh, if I'm talking about La Long Bank, I may have got that wrong. The top of Ormsby Bank. However, that said, please support the proposed plan that is set out before you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Thompson, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I didn't particularly want to reminisce, as some members have done, but I think it's worth putting on record, just to remind the previous speaker, it was July 2014 when the debate took place. Uh, I proposed an amendment. Uh, the amendment was tabled. I wasn't allowed to speak to my amendment. So, not surprisingly, I therefore couldn't support the motion. But that's history. What are, what are we looking at today? We're looking at a proposal uh, the Cabinet member ha has asked us to consider. That there are three elements to this, the local plan, the policies map, and the supplementary planning document, all of which are integral and all of which are really important. Uh, but just to make sure that we know what we're voting on, I'm going to uh, read some of the small print. These plans are set out how local authorities, local authorities will manage development across their areas and include details of identified sites 
that have been allocated for development. Local plans also include open spaces and specific sites that are intended to be protected. Significantly, reporting on the uh, inspector's uh, visit, there are no need to consider allocating sites for additional housing. The Borough Council are also asked to adopt the local plan policies map. Now if we take these together, we will see that the local policies map includes a strategic gap in which no housing is deemed to be considered for development. And yet, what have we had recently? Just after the Cabinet approved this document to come to Council, an officer's recommendation that we build outside development limits, that we build within the strategic gap. Fortunately, uh, the majority of members of the Regulatory Committee disagreed with the officer's recommendation. So perhaps this well-written document should be re-read, not just by elected members, <laughs> but by members of the regulatory advising group. Other small print. What this plan will do is give the council greater control over the location and form of new development and greater capacity to resist development proposals which do not meet local plan policy objectives. Remind ourselves of that. So, what also is included, uh, Mr. Mayor, in the local plan is not just a strategic gap in the policies map, but reference to conservation areas and to remind ourselves that we have 17 of those and each of those should have a local management plan. How many do have local management plans? None. We are piloting a scheme in Saltburn where a draft from the local <coughs> community came landed in the relevant cabinet members in tray in December 2013. Where are we now? May 2018. Do we have a management plan yet? So, I'm going to support the local plan, I'm going to support the policies map, and I'm going to support the supplementary planning document, which is absolutely crucial for developing the South Chiefs site. But in parallel to that, what we need to give recognition to I ask you to sum up, please, is Thompson. that the small print needs to be interpreted. So we have set up, uh, Mr. Baer, and I will finish on this, the housing forum. And that is going to be critical to looking at what we're actually doing, to identifying need, building where that needs to be manifested and finding the support to do that. And in particular, looking at affordable and rentable property. So, Mr. Mayor, I fully support the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Lanigan, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not going to go back over all ground, um, other than to say it was unfit for purpose, and Councillor Thompson did at that time. We had seven serious issues uh, on this side of the chamber regarding that plan when it came. I actually went to the, see the then leader of the council and the cabinet member involved in that in order to try and get this plan through that chamber at that time. It was point blank refused by the leader of the council to pick up those amendments on that that would have given us a plan, a local plan, uh, which was not accepted by that administration at that time. The officers did say, and a very senior officer in this council, 
it was not fit for purpose and it would have fallen down at its first hurdle. Having said that, we've worked together as a cross-party group. We've got this in place. Um, Councillor Nightingale was absolutely right. It was horrendous. That meeting that I had to go through and the what we had up at Ormsby, the officers from the planning department um, went for approval on that site. The members of the committee said no, and so it went to uh, inspection review, which for me, I was representing the members. I was told I had no paperwork unless I went and got it myself. I had no officer support. There was absolutely nothing. They had three barristers, and I'm sat there, stood there as a lay member, for hour upon hour upon hour, while they debated this backwards and forwards. We didn't actually stand a chance. And the next one that I went to was at Saltburn, and they asked me to do that because I'd done the previous one. We had barrister support from the council, and at that time, the officers did give me some paperwork to help. But as a layperson up against Barristan, I think they had four down at Saltburn on their side, and an entourage of other officers passing them papers backwards and forwards, we didn't. I think now that we've got this, bear in mind what Councillor Thompson has said, that we can move forward with this. I don't think whether we'd got that through in 2014 or not. Um, with central government, as it was, they wanted houses built all over the damn place, and I think no matter what had come in, and with the amendments that we needed there that were not in place, we would have had the same scenario that we had up until this local plan. So I absolutely endorse this, uh, and we will go forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lanigan. Councillor Norton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether they were questions or statements uh, and opinions, but I will endeavour to deal with some of the, 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 the comments uh, that were made. In particular, can I turn to the several times quoted unfit for purpose, and certainly uh, that that was made by an officer of this authority. Um, I went to great pains, having heard that statement some months ago, to establish just who this person was. And to date, there is no officer that not fit for purpose can be attributed to. I think what is important, this is a local plan for the future, from today, and it's our plan for this borough. In relation to uh, Councillor Lanigan and, and a comment made by Councillor Nightingale, that members were left um, slightly exposed during uh, appeal, uh, planning appeal processes. I can say that, uh, and Councillor Dick was the chair of planning at the time, I recall as a very, uh, well, much newer councillor than I am now, uh, sitting on the planning committee and listening to, I think, Councillor Lanigan making the comment in a planning meeting. And I then began the process and won the support of the planning committee the, and the cabinet that we, if we are faced with a, a planning uh, appeal and a member is the person to represent uh, the, the other side of that appeal, then they would receive the appropriate support from the officers, or if not from the officers, certainly from council that would be engaged and paid for by this uh, local authority. In relation to the steelworks, uh, 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 Councillor Walsh, let's not write it off completely. We've got a steelworks in Skin and Grove and one in Lackenby. They don't make steel anymore, but they certainly churn out huge tons of steel, uh, having rolled it in their mills, and of course across the River Tees at Hartlepool. So British steel still continues here, might have continued even more had we had a more responsive government at the time SSI was facing um, its uh, difficulties. Councillor Thompson makes some very valid points and one indeed should read the small print before you dash off and engage in uh, planning uh, applications. I would take issue with his observations of the Saltburn 
application. However, as I understand it, uh, there's a potential for that to go uh, to appeal, and it might be seen as uh, improper for me to comment. But when I meet with Councillor Thompson tomorrow on another matter, I'll exchange that view personally. The local plan, the policies map, and the development uh, plan for the South Tees are with us, and I ask this chamber to endorse them. And in so doing, can I first of all uh, add to the names that have been listed, and perhaps just go through some of them again, the people who've actually been really instrumental in putting this plan together and getting involved uh, with the nitty gritty of it. I myself have read the document, I myself read the draft and got involved, but frankly, as for trying to put the thing together, I, I take no credit for that. It has to go to Mark Ladyman, Adrian Miller, and Rebecca Wren. And perhaps the early work on the plan by my predecessor, Councillor Dale uh, Quigley. And let's not forget Alex Conte, now of another borough, uh, uh, working for Middleborough Borough Council, uh, who did quite a lot of work in the early days. And of course, um, I'm reminded that uh, the late Councillor Abbott and Councillor Val Bolton, who isn't uh, in this authority anymore, were also significant uh, contributors. But I also know that there are many members in this chamber who gave of their time and their energy and their commitment during the uh, local plan process. Thank you, each and every one of you. <coughs> I therefore commend the local plan and the attachments to the authority, and can I say, don't you just love it when a plan comes together? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Norton. <coughs> Proposal is the adoption of the Red Car and Cleveland local plan and South Tees area supre supplementary planning document. And please have a show of hands for all those in favour, please. I think that is carried. Any against? Okay, that is carried. I can see Mr Miller is in the room, no doubt he will be going to open the bottle of champagne with his colleagues. <laughs> Item 10 is to consider motions. Motion 1, and I invite please Councillor Walsh. Thank you Mr Mayor. I'll be fairly brief. The resolution speaks for itself as a result of obviously the news from two to three weeks ago of the um, news of a proposed merger between two of the largest retailers in the UK and fears and concerns over how that may impact on this borough both in terms of impacting on consumers, impacting on suppliers to those two companies, and above all, impact on the staff and workers of those companies. And if you look at the resolution, you'll see that behind the generality of the resolution, there are six bullet points, which if this resolution is passed and goes to the Competition and Markets Authority, would represent, first of all, the actual fears we have in the first three bullet points, and in the last three bullet points, some very specific recommendations we made to Competition and Markets Authority to both protect uh, consumers, to protect supply, local suppliers, and particularly to protect workers who may be affected by any divestment of properties. Now, I've got to say this resolution came as a result of a very, very early morning phone call which is from two girls working in one of the three stores in Skelton and Saltburn mentioned in that resolution. They'd heard the merger <coughs> news that morning, which is more than I had. And all I could say was, whilst this council may not be able to stop one of the biggest corporate uh, mergers in Western Europe, we would at least try to see what representations we could make on their behalf and their colleagues. Hence this resolution, and from there, a council resolution to the Competition of Markets Authority will allow the res resolution to go through. Now, the fears of this resolution are not just me or others scaremongering. They're also the fears of professional retailer and labour market analysts who suggest that in order to gain regulatory approval, it will become necessary for these companies to sell off a large amount of stores, streamline their suppliers, and streamline their product lines. 
The reality is, despite the corporate gloss, it will be local shoppers that suffer from rising prices, and local workers that may be feeling for their jobs if this goes ahead without adequate oversight and investigation. It remains to be seen if this supermarket sweepstake is a real deal or a bargain basement ready meal. Hundreds of thousands of workers stand to be affected, and we all know that such announcements tend to be followed by gloss management speak like rationalisation in the name of efficiency, and what that normally means is euphemism for job losses and cuts in pay, terms and conditions would be wholly unacceptable to any responsible retailer. Now imagine like the girls at one of the three local shops who rang me on that Sunday morning, finding the early news leaking all this but with no worth from the employer when they clocked on. A local councillor was all they could think of. I think of them and I think of the suppliers. I cite a man called Mike Cherry, the chairman of the Federation of Small Businesses, who was called on as salesman's as to explain how the two companies will merge the supply chains and asked him if cast iron reassurances that cost savings won't be achieved simply by milking their small suppliers for all their worth. And the word milk, of course, can also take us to another group, unobtrusive group in our community that do exist, the farming community, the dairy community, the arable, commun the arable farming community, who will find their conditions and the demands on them by the big multi multiplexes, such as Asda and Saints, was even more, even more um, uh, imposing. What's going to happen to the employees in terms of their pensions? Asda operates a defined <coughs> contribution scheme, while Sainsbury's, which also controls Argos, operates a defined benefit scheme. Will Sainsbury's employees be forced to join the inferior Asda scheme? Now, I've got to say that it's the work, the brains, and the brawn of what is actually a mainly female workforce that built these companies. And unlike speculators, they have a long term interest in the well being of those companies. They should not be treated in, in not, not be traded in as part of a merger and take over bizarre a bazaar where I think say we got rid of hiring fairs in this country two hundred years ago, we should not reintroduce them. I want to make the point that of course this would not happen in any other EU country where workers have statutory rights of information and consultation, and also have employee elected directors on company boards. At the very least, the same should apply to the UK. And if we can shake off the nightmare Brexit, it should, even for the peace, it should be imposed, even only for the peace of mind of those two girls from Sainsbury's in Skelton. We all see the geographical convergence in East Cleveland between the three stores within the three miles of each other. We see the convergences between um, Middlesbrough and South Bank, one of the largest, department, one of the largest um, supermarkets in our area. These company, these stores are at risk, our consumers are at risk, our suppliers are at risk, and I just hope and just wish that and uh, ask members to support this unanimously so these, these concerns can be put to the Competitions Authority. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Do I have a second, please? <coughs> yes, please, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to second the motion and reserve the right to speak. Thank you, Councillor Holloway. Uh, Hannaway. Uh, Councillor Turner, please. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, these are two private companies. It's a private enterprise, and this council should not be expressing concerns about something that we have too limited knowledge of. And I'd go even further, and for all Councillor Walsh, who's been very eloquent and, and appears to have done his research, um, I suggest to him that he actually hasn't and he has no understanding of this industry whatsoever, right, or of the situation that you're trying to involve us in. I spent 25 years working in food retail for one of the companies involved, and I can absolutely guarantee that most of your statements are either badly thought through or just plain wrong. So let's take your issue about product ranges, right, and you think the consumer might lose out on product range or choice. So you're obviously unaware that 95% of a supermarket's product range is identical to what you would find in another supermarket. And the 5% that differs tends to be own label products or white label products. And to give you an example of that, an Asda own brand 800 gram bread loaf is made at exactly the same bakery as a Sainsbury's own brand 800 gram bread loaf. And they're just packaged differently. Right? So there will be no 
detriment in choice for consumers. He then went on to talk about suppliers. And again, what you don't know and you don't understand is it might actually benefit suppliers in our region. Asda has a very, very strong track record of taking on board local suppliers right, and putting them into their own stores. Jeff the Chef Palmo is a great example of something that is only stocked in the Northeast, and it was started by Asda, and it's something Sainsbury's and their corporate view in London doesn't have the opportunity to do. So I put it to you that there might be benefits for local suppliers. However, where your motion really shows its ignorance, right, is in the statement relating to the proximity of different outlets, and your suggestion that some of these might close. So you bring up Sainsbury's in Middlesbrough, Asda in Southbank. Asda tried to buy the new empty Sainsbury's building at Middlehaven and couldn't. The demographics of the two customers, the demographics of the two outlets and the catchment area hardly cross over whatsoever. And the only beneficiary of any business closing either of those sites would be Tesco, right? And that's something that certainly won't happen. What makes it even worse though, when you scaremonger about East Cleveland, and I'm disappointed that you didn't reassure those two girls from Sainsbury's that rang you, you talk about Asda, Sainsbury's in North Skelton, Sainsbury's in Saltburn. They are three completely different stores. One is a supermarket, one is a large local, one is a convenience store. They service different customers, different communities, and different needs. And there isn't a business on this planet that would close one of those sites. The shopping mission in a small convenience store, like in Skelton, in your ward, right, bears no resemblance to the people that do a weekly shop at Asda in Skelton, also in your ward. So those two stores will run side by side. If you were looking for a jobs angle to say, look, we're going to lose jobs, you shouldn't look closer to here. You should have looked at Rosebury Road, where Asda and Sainsbury's share the same car park, share much of the same customers. Right? However, I also know Sainsbury's has been looking to offload that store for three years now. The dozen or so staff that work in there, their jobs are already at risk. So merging with Asda and the increased trade Asda would get if Sainsbury's closed may just actually safeguard the jobs for the people that work in that store. What you also find with that is those 12 people that work in there, right, and I know it's 12 because it used to be one of my stores, right, also have opportunities. Could you sum up, stores, please, Councillor Turner? Certainly will, Mr. Mayor, in five other stores within a three mile radius. Right? So, in conclusion, Mr. Mayor, I don't believe this council has the necessary understanding to push this motion through. We certainly shouldn't have members spreading doom and gloom messages in their wards and their communities. Right? They should be reassuring people that there are positives in this. And to give you one final positive, right? the residents in Saltburn, 12 months ago, had to go to Redcar if they wanted something from Argos. Right? They can now go to Saltburn and collect it. The residents in Gisborough are exactly the same. What benefit would be to the residents in Skelton if they could then go and use an Argos site with inside the Asda supermarket? That's it. Mr Mayor, I won't be supporting this and I think this council should throw it out forthwith. Thank you. New Councillor Turner. Deputy Mayor, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <coughs> well, when I first sort of skimmed through this motion, I did think it was scaremongering and rather pointless, uh, scaremongering for the reasons that have been given, and uh, pointless because there'll be thousands of objections to this, I would think, piling, piling up at the Competitions and Markets Authority. However, when I read it through more carefully, I, unlike Councillor Turner, I think there's some merit particularly in paragraph three, about the, the possibility of stores closing because of this merger. Perhaps not between 
South Bank and Middlesbrough, but I think that there could very well be a threat in East Cleveland. And we are, and the motion after all, is only uh, we're expressing our concerns. We perhaps, if, if, they, if they ever read this at all, we're putting them on their guard that we, you know, that we might not be particularly happy in this area if they uh, don't consider our citizens. However, what my main criticism of all this is the structure of it, actually, rather than some of its contents. Because I'm quite, well, I, I'm going to vote for it <laughs> if this is, it, it's not possible, actually. Down to the bottom of the third bullet point, I, I'd go along with that, I think, on balance. But then to say, th that's saying we don't want it, but then we say, if it happens, this, this, and this. If you want something to be turned down, you go, you say, we don't want it, full stop. You don't say, we don't want it, but if we do get it, that weakens your case. So I think it's badly structured as well, but I think on balance, just on balance, I'll vote for it. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Councillor Clark, please. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you to the, uh, the Council's very own consumer champion for bringing this uh, item forward. Um, I like to speak on things like this. Um, I, I don't know if people know, but uh, Sainsbury's are actually going through a very rigorous restructuring programme right now. And uh, Tesco have been through one, Morrison's have been through one as well. And this uh, proposed merger is in two phases. The first phase is for 40 working days, and we're getting very close to the end of that. And the second phase is for 24 weeks. Uh, the uh, Competitions and Markets Authority has set a deadline of Monday the 4th of June for initial information gathering. So if we're going to put something forward, I assume we've got to put it forward by the 4th of June, Mr. Mayor. Um, once the first phase is complete, the CMA will decide whether to move to phase two or not. Sainsbury's chief executive, a gentleman named Mike Cooper, has asked the CMA to ignore phase one and to move straight to phase two. There's been speculation, and I've done my research, as we all do, we Google it, and it's shown that possibly anywhere from 73 to 245 supermarkets could be at risk if the proposed merger does go ahead. The executives of various companies, though, say there'll be no closures and prices will come down. They're bound to say that, aren't they? I mean, that's what they want to do. I don't know if it's widely known in this chamber that uh, Mr. Coop has actually worked in various roles at Unilever, Tesco, Iceland and Asda. So he's well known in that circle of executives and friends. Rather embarrassingly though, in April, Mr. Coop was engaged in a number of interviews about the forthcoming merger. After the first interview occurred, during the transmission to his, or the transition to his next uh, interview, his microphone remained switched on and he didn't know. And he was recorded, and he's been all over the internet <laughs> singing. One, two. Where in the money? <laughs> Where in the money? Well, oh, it's going to be in the money because the reports say that uh, if this does go through, Mr. Coop himself could be given £600,000 if the merger is successful. I just leave it open for your conjecture just to think about it. But, uh, you know, these people, they're certainly out to line their pockets and look after themselves, don't they? And what uh, our consumer champion was saying there about people who are concerned. Of course they're concerned about their jobs. So it's very important that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the motion, I think I will accept it. I think it's badly worded as well, but I, think I will accept it and approve it as well. Because we're, we're talking about people at the lower scale and not the higher executives, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Glyn Nightingale, please. Uh, thank you very much again, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
Uh, first of all, um, I think we've got to recognize the complexity of this particular market. I've been asked to use the word oligopolistic, uh, which is what it is. There are just few sellers, uh, potentially. Uh, but the market is, is, is much more uh, complex because of the change in consumer habits. Um, you've only got to look at the changes in the last few years with uh, the introduction of the discounters like Aldi, uh, like, um, yeah, Aldi and uh, uh, Lidl. And, and of course, the increase in online buying, uh, not just from Amazon as well. And it's not just for, uh, for uh, things like, um, well, in, in our case at the moment, shredders but it's also in, in the case you can get your groceries online uh, if, you're looking, um, if, if you're looking for uh, quick uh, buys and cheaper buys. So we have to recognize that, that this is a much more complex market and there may well be disguised levels of competition which um, uh, are not actually apparent when we just look at the big four or five uh, supermarkets that are involved in, 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 in the grocery trade. Um, but we do have to recognize as well that this is quite a legitimate um, motion to put forward to this council because there are people in this borough who may be detrimentally affected. And uh, the, um, the points that were made by Councillor Turner, I, I, I can't agree with. I mean, he, he, he quite, uh, quite rightly he, he points to the complexities involved in, in this particular issue. But it is legitimate for this council to be concerned about, one, the job situation in this area, the consumer choice in this area as well, and, and perhaps that should be paramount as well. Uh, perhaps I should also declare an interest, Mr. Mayor, in saying that I've banned Sainsbury's. We don't shop at Sainsbury's, uh, and I'm not giving, giving the reasons for that, but we don't, we don't shop at Sainsbury's. Um, so um, in conclusion, I think we've got to recognize that this is a legitimate motion we're, we're allowed to vote on this because it does concern the people in, in, our, in our borough. And it is legitimate as well to have, uh, on, on just to countering the points that made by, by Councillor Kay, it is legitimate as well to, to put forward some concerns that might, we, we should be concerned with um, if the Competition and uh, Markets Authority did actually let this go through. And because of the complexity in the market, there is a real possibility of this. And so the, the final three points that are made there are uh, particularly cogent to this particular issue. In conclusion, then, uh, the, uh, the Liberal Democrats will, in fact, be voting for this motion. Uh, and um, I hope it will uh, go through and there will be some action taken by, by this council to ensure that people locally are actually protected. Thank you, Councillor Nightingale. Councillor Mason, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and congratulations. Um, I, like the previous couple of speakers, do have a few reservations about this motion, not least actually in, in terms of some of the grammar, but I'm um, going to let that pass. Um, it's particularly pleasing to um, see a motion from the Labour Party calling for more free markets, um, although I do wonder, Mr. Mayor, if they've passed the memo to Mr. MacDonald. Um, this merger of the second and third biggest supermarkets, Mr. Mayor, will con concentrate the market in a few hands. The new company stands to receive almost one of every three pounds spent on groceries in this country. And added to Tesco's 30% share of the market, this is not good news for shoppers either in terms of choice or value. As far as I'm concerned, paragraph two is absolutely spot on. This merger of Sainsbury's and Asda will undoubtedly have an adverse effect on food producers. Sainsbury's and Asda have said that the merger will cut prices by 10% for shoppers. They have also said that there will not be job losses or store, store, store closures. But if there are to be no store closures or job losses, then there is only one way to deliver price cuts, and that is to further squeeze the suppliers, the farmers, and the production workers who, quite frankly, are already over a barrel. I'm less convinced by paragraph three. I don't necessarily see the greatest danger as stores too cl close together being forced to close. Um, on my logic, if there is currently enough business to sustain two stores, then the ownership of those stores won't make any difference uh, to that um, demand. Um, although, admittedly, it is 
possible that the Competition and Market Force there, um, Authority um, could insist that some of those stores are sold to other providers. Um, the greatest danger is that the biggest players in the supermarket industry will abuse their position to create local monopolies. Because markets only work where there is a healthy level of competition to force down prices for customers. The Competition and Markets Authority exists to promote competition for the benefit of consumers. It is said that it is, it is likely to review the merger. We need to speak up for the consumers and producers of our borough to ensure that they are not expl exploited by this merger. Whilst this motion isn't perfect in my view, I don't want to let the best be the enemy of the good and will support it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Councillor Thompson, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to recognise that uh, Neil Parrish, who is uh, Chairman of the Environmental Food and Rural Affairs Committee, has said that cost savings being promised through this merger must not come through squeezing those further down the supply chain. So I think we, there is some unanimity there in terms of uh, that uh, concern. My concern in all of this is that we as a borough need to be thinking as a borough. So our first and prime thought is about regeneration, about creating wealth, so that the residents of this borough have more money to spend. Now, what are we doing about that? We have a raft of policies, do we not, about growth. We have, across the trunk road there, a site waiting to de be developed. We've just had an announcement Ben Houchen has secured a deal with the Thai banks. Now, all of that looks to putting more growth into this community. But where should that money be spent? Should we not have a retail policy in this authority that says where retail outlets should be allowed to be built? Should we, at Skelton, for example, be building an ASDA? Should we, at Skelton, for example, be building an Aldi? These are questions that now are history. Because when these proposals were put forward, without having a fundamental retail strategy development for this authority, the residents and workers who worked at Sainsbury's and Saltburn were saying, please don't build, because our jobs will be at risk. So what's transpired? We built the Aldi at Skelton. Has there been a job reduction at Sainsbury's and Saltburn? No, there has not. We heard small retailers on Skelton High Street saying, Please don't build Asta at Skelton because we will close. What has happened? People have been drawn to East Cleveland to shop in East Cleveland. People who left East Cleveland to shop elsewhere stay in East Cleveland. And what's happened to Skelton High Street? It has improved. So what's going to happen when Aldi opens? Aldi will compete with ASDA. Now, what will that mean? ASDA will be pushed into doing certain economic decisions based on competition. So what makes some sense is, well, actually, we're not going to wait for that competition. We're going to merge with someone else so that we can share overheads. We can share marketing. We can share all of the purchasing powers that we have. So doesn't that make economic sense? So where are the reservations in any of this? First of all, we have to be assured that the Competition and Marketing Authority are going to look seriously at any negatives associated with the merger. 
And we have an assurance from Rachel Reeves, do we not, who is chair of the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee, that she's going to look critically at the negatives, bearing in mind the positives of a merger. So, do we say, let's bring on Aldi, let's bring on Lidl, and see the demise of Sainsbury's and Asda? Or do we say, let's give them an opportunity to think about their business plan? Could you sum up, please, Councillor Thompson? <laughs> and if there is any negative in this, it's for Asda, because their level of service, their level of activity and credibility with their purchasing and downstream suppliers will be uplifted, will it not, by Sainsbury, who are a leader in the market in setting standards. So there's a real positive to come out of this. There are pension regulators, there are employment legislation, which will look at all of the negatives contained in this motion. We are not here to legislate for that. So whilst I recognize the, the concerns that employees have, and I would echo what uh, Councillor said previously, we should not be negative about conditions and support where we can growth. So I'm not going to support this motion. There are elements in it that I understand <coughs> and agree with. But on balance, it is not going to do anything to support our growth plans in this borough. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Hannaway, please. Thank you. <coughs> yes, uh, most of the, the the shoppers may stay in East Cleveland, Councillor Thompson, but most of the money they spend in as, as it doesn't. Um, whatever happened to the free market economy? You know, the idea that uh, the goods and services needed by citizens, or as we call ourselves now, consumers, are best provided by companies in healthy competition on a level playing field, untrammeled by too much government regulation. Because I think many of the things that Councillor Turner says would be perfectly rational if we have a free market economy. But since Mrs. Thatcher said you can't buck the market, there has been a, a decay of that idea, I think, into, in all sorts of parts of the economy, into very large companies dominating an increasing share of the market. And then after that, after those big companies um, took over the market, then they developed a, a, a shared new culture uh, across all kinds of businesses that was based on ruthlessly maximizing shareholder value. And of course, that should work, shouldn't it? If you make a good product and you sell lots of it, then you should have more money for your, sh your shareholders. But there's a very good book called Obliquity. It's not a great title, I know. It's by a man called John Kay. And it shows what happens when you, when you focus ruthlessly on maximizing shareholder value and the ways in which it discourages innovation uh, and it encourages short-term decision-making. And I think that's what we have here. I think this merger, we have a short-term decision being made. The worst example, or one of the worst examples of this uh, focus on shareholder value was uh, Boeing. The Boeing company nearly crashed, if you'll pardon the pun. <laughs> and only when it was put back into the hands of people who were actually enthusiastic about making aeroplanes did it begin to recover. And I suspect this merger as well is driven by the desire to keep shareholder value high, partly by trying to protect both the companies from the terrible giant called Amazon. And it probably won't work because what they really need to do is to go back to their roots and to think about what their purpose is, what they want to do uh, for the people who come to buy their products. Because another issue is that on the back of this ruthless focus on shareholder value is that ethics tend to go out the window. About seven years ago, I think it was one pound in every eight was spent in Tesco's. Uh, what happened when they focused on shareholder value and the company started to fail was that they started to lie about their accounts, as is well documented. And of course, that creates an issue of public trust. Again, many of the things you said, Councillor Turner, would be rational <laughs> if we could trust them. I suspect that these, this merger won't be good for residents, either as consumers or as workers. And we need to also consider the effect on our unemployment figures. 
because although the figure used, the claimant cap, is, uh, puts the figure very low, something somewhere between 3.5 to 4 percent, that measure is only one measure. If you use the measure used by the National Office of Statistics, it's just below 6 percent. And there's also a study from Sheffield ha uh, Hallam University, which is backed by the Joseph Browntree Foundation, which puts it in Redcar and Cleveland at nearly 10 percent. So it is of great concern to us that jobs might be lost. However, I think the purpose of this motion, and all we can really do here, is to ask the companies to address our concerns and to ask them to work in collaboration with the Competition and Markets Authority. Thank you, Councillor Hannaway. Councillor Walsh, would you like to come back in? All right, thanks very much indeed. I think just to make two or three comments. Um, the first is, uh, somebody said, that, did I scare those two ladies? No, I didn't, actually. I think I'm very pleased that I was prepared to say and to promise them I would take it back to this council. They also asked if they're members of a trade union. One was. She was a member of Osdor, and I told her to see her union, which I hope, I hope she has done. Um, secondly, I'll make some comments on one or two of the um, speakers. I think, first of all, I heard Steve Turner, and I recognise his background and recognise his knowledge of the industry. Wouldn't demur from that. But also, I've got to express, you know, some of my concerns because it really did appear to be a view that we, as a council, shouldn't bother our pretty heads about such massive uh, changes and such complex structures that might be imposed on the retail industry. That we were dealing in an area where we don't have expertise, and we should leave it to them. And frankly, I think at one point I thought I was listening more to the chief executive of Walmart than a council for Mask. I appreciate he talks about uh, the labelling of foods and products. When I was a kid, for a time, looking for some, you know, some money and um, and uh, some some back pocket money during the holidays, I worked in a branch, a factory of, pep of Pepsi Cola, and I can certainly remember uh, the labelling of Pepsi cans. It was Pepsi from. 10 to 11, then it would be, I don't know, the co-op from 12 to 1 o'clock. It goes on. But because of that, do, do we actually want to protect that kind of marketing where all the goods come from one source? I mean, what does this mean for consumer choice? It doesn't mean very much. And by effectively acquiescing in this takeover, we're actually going to deepen that. If I really want to hear experts or if I really want to hear people who, th who know the, in the industry, I think I'd like to listen to people like the National Farmers Union, who made their comments very clear, the Federation of Small Businesses, who made their position clear, the Consumers Association, who made their position clear, the unions such as Alsdor, the Shop Workers Union, and the TUC. Uh, secondly, on this attempt to say we're scaring people, in this resolution we don't mention anywhere uh, closure, because we know what's going to happen, that they will probably be ordered by the Competition Markets Authority to divest a number of their stores. Now, we know what divestment means. It, mean, it will mean the smallest, it will mean the, uh, the more remote stores, it will mean the ones with lower footfall. And where will they go to? Well, they won't go to Asda and Little, who look at spe specific sizes and specific layouts. It's going to go to the very much down market booze, crisps, and fag outlets. And with, those term and with the terms and conditions you're going to expect from working for outfits like that, that is something we should not be supporting. Steve talked about the issues of looking at this. It's rather strange in the sense that we're trying to oppose this and then ask for conditions. Well, actually, we're not opposing it. We're, we're flagging out fears. But we know it's almost like to happen. So what we're looking at is to put conditions on. We do this week in, week out at the regulatory committee. Nothing new here. And if you look at the terms and conditions we're talking about here, we're asking the Competition Markets Authority, you've got the legal obligation to impose conditions on any company to recognise that uh, the product range issues have to be addressed, to look in terms of adverse changes, the standards that may be imposed on existing suppliers, protect those, those suppliers, and conditions on the possible purchase of any of the outlets that they keep QP far longer than the statutory period. Again, something that can be imposed on by a legal agreement. We're looking for a better deal for local people, a better deal for the shoppers, a better deal for consumers and a better deal for the lo local suppliers. Frankly, I think we're standing up for the people of the borough, we're standing up for consumer choice, and we're standing up, frankly, 
for the little man against the big battalions, and I would hope we would be supporting this today. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Can we go to the vote, please? All those in favour of the motion. All those against, please. Thank you. The motion is carried. Second motion, uh, moved by Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And again, congratulations on your post. Um, the motion is as, as read, Chair, um, and all this motion does is alleviates the necessity for a Freedom of Information request mm -hmm. to be made to this Council and makes public the information regarding Peel's dealings with Red Car and Cleveland Borough Council regarding the airport. Since discussions took place to sell its 75% stake, or the public 75% stake of Teesside Airport. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Do we have a second, please? I second that motion. Thank Mr. you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Lanigan. Councillor Massey, please. I think uh, we on this side can support this motion due to the key words that are contained within it around where legal advice confirms that confidentiality must be maintained. I do think that there's quite a lot of revisionist history and a lot of rumours around dealings with the airport, particularly across the Tees Valley in general. And there's a huge leap from the decision taken in 2003 when I wasn't old enough to vote um, to now. And the decision made then may have been right for the time, but it's not something that we can look back on now with rose-tinted glasses. It was a decision made by a different council at a much different time. Um, lest we forget that this, the policy of local regional airports being divested from local authority control began in 1983, not with the longest suicide note in history, but with the Conservative manifesto from that era. Um, the Conservative 83 manifesto says that they will privatise regional airports, and that's quite clearly what happened over the next 20 years. Um, all 15 regional airports with a turnover of over £1 million were privatised after that act, which came in in 1986. Um, the fate of our airport, it's a huge asset to us. We need it to stay open, but we have to recognise the fact that the regional airport sector across the country is a particularly challenging one. In the last number of years, Plymouth, Manston, Cambridge, Bristol and Blackpool has closed but reopened slightly. <coughs> They've all been challenged and have all largely closed the doors. But despite this difficult backdrop, we continue to have a regional airport and we need to see that maintained. But we need to work with Peel and the Tees Valley Combined Authority in order to sustain the long-term future of this airport. I think the motion's a little opportunistic in this regard, and it doesn't really ask for anything new after the Hartlepool decision that has been already alluded to. And Hartlepool have released some documents on this, but I do think that we can generally support this because of the caveat I mentioned earlier around confidentiality, where legal advice confirms that is the case. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Councillor Walsh, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, I'm looking around. I think there was only a few of us around in 2003, but at that particular period, I was actually uh, the leader of the council. And, you know, in this respect, you know, I've got a memory and I can answer some questions. But unfortunately, not all. As I still were issues of then, issues of commercial confidentiality, and they are here still with us today. But let's be very blunt. As Chris has said, in short, most small and municipal airports like ours, with meagre services and low cash flow, were told by the, certainly the, John, the major government, and I've got to be very honest, they're also told, by us, told to us by Tony Blair and Gordon Brown that there wasn't that chance of state support for any development. Uh, we were told to go to private sector support. In our case, that's a terminal improvement and a control tower upgrade. Now, I suppose we could have struggled on with the first putback, and we would have told the RDA that let's put this on hold. But we couldn't do this, we couldn't do anything at all about the second, as it had to meet new Civil Aviation Authority and EC standards. Hence the decision to go out to look for a private partner. And I've got to say that when we came to the beauty contest, and I was there at the beauty contest, if you think Peel were bad, you want to see some of the others who turned up. 
few were actually on the day the, 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 the best that we could find. At the time, and I've got to be very clear, we need to look at this in terms of the local, local economy. At the same time, the bottom was falling out of the bucket in space holiday destinations that Teesside Airport had traditionally catered for. And at a time when joblessness had taken its toll and followed by the first manifestations of the gig economy, whilst the one link to London, British Midlands link, was paying megabucks for a Heathrow slot that actually only served a fairly valueless, as they would see it, set of trips. On that basis, I won't say it was a distress sale, but it was pretty well near it. And in short, that's where we are now. Now, you know, I believe that Teesside Airport has a future, but I've got to say also that all the past external reports for the airport, done for the local councils and done for the regional development agency and done for the government, were unremittingly bleak. Let's not make a mistake about it. Chris has talked about the airports that have closed, and we can actually see what it's like outside. In the Premier League, there's just one airport, it's called Manchester. In the Championship, you've got Leeds, Bradford, Newcastle, Birmingham, and Ruth, and perhaps one or two others. Everybody else, including Teesside, are in Division 2. And as Chris has said, some of them, like Exeter, Blackpool, Manson, have closed, and others are just doing general aviation, light like aircraft, cargoes, or the odd charter. A key issue, Joe, in terms of Teesside Airport is keeping Skipple which actually offers better connections, is certainly, from my experience, better than the London Heathrow scatter terminals. I have often said that I think the great future for Teesside Airport may not be in passengers. It, it will be, it, or it could be, and would be with freight. It could be and should be with servicing the British Army at Catterick. It's uh, very, 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 very contingent to that, to that um, base, which is going to be the biggest base in Britain. And in terms of distribution of goods and services, it's near perhaps one of the best road linkages in the north of England. But let's, let's just finish by, by saying there is no golden age that can, we can pull back as much as we'd like to. And also I want to say that there is no hidden secret at the bottom of all this. It's a very simple issue, which was faced by local authorities at that time, which would not alter one iota. If it was to happen now, you'd have to take the same decision. There is no Da Vinci code in the middle of it. There is no hidden hoard of gold. There is no um, strange Masonic handshakes between Peel and the local authorities. People like to believe that kind of thing, and I think this is what's motivating a lot of this. But nevertheless, I believe in openness, and the more we can actually make open to actually bring the disinfectant of the rays of sunshine into the business of local authorities, the better. But you're not going to find, at the end of the day, that great secret everybody thinks is there because it doesn't exist. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Councillor Thompson, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, there, are, there are two elements to this, this motion. One is historic, uh, and, and the other is if. Now, uh, as uh, a representative of this authority, on the uh, Tees Valley Combined Authority Scrutiny Committee, we have, uh, from time to time, had to have discussions about uh, various developments that may or may not be taking place uh, in Tees Valley. When we have uh, come to the point about talking about the airport, and we can talk all day about options and speculation and potential and aspirations, but what we can't talk about is information that we don't have. So uh, members may recall that we had a yellow paper presented to Cabinet uh, some two years ago that asked uh, for consideration to be given to a certain topic, uh, but because it was on yellow pages I can't talk about it, even to other members of uh, the council who weren't uh, necessarily at the meeting because of the outcomes. <coughs> so one of the difficulties that one has as an elected member, so I, I, I fully sympathize uh, with, with Councillor Davies in trying to be at least able to access information. So coming back to the motion, the, the two elements, as I said previously. One is to publish the information that may be available. 
Uh, there's no reason why that necessarily has to be uh, to the public, but it could certainly be to uh, elected members representing the public, so that they were better advised if and when we need to make any decisions concerning the airport, which undoubtedly we will be doing within the next 12 months. And the other is an if. Well, that if is going to be too late anyway by the time it happens for us to have any decision uh, taking on the results of the information that may or may not have been imparted in 2003. So uh, I, I share concerns. Uh, I, I will support the motion in principle, but it, it, it's, an, it's a wake up call, isn't it, to all of us elected members that we need to be given more information. We need to have the respect that we will retain that information in a confidential manner if we are asked to. But how can we be making really informed decisions about incredibly important commercial decisions if we don't have all that information? Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Davis, do you want to come back in? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, uh, just going back to uh, Councillor Walsh's line on openness and transparency, um, I agree, yeah, it's about time we are open and transparent. Um, I would also uh, like of, to have liked this motion to have gone further. I mean, uh, Steve Newton, the monitoring officer, will tell you that there was loads of to and fro about what went on this motion. Um, I'm not confident uh, that Peel uh, are being totally honest with councillors, councils, or just not being honest with certain people on the council anyway. Um, I was alluded to a document that was released from a member of Peel staff called Project Falcon. And I would like the member of this council that sits on that board to maybe go back to Peel and find out what Project Falcon was, and then maybe update the councillors in this council chamber about Project Falcon maybe bring that to the public for as well. Um, I am not confident at all, uh, to be honest as well, that the, what Councillor Massey said as well, who, who decides what is considered confidential? Is it certain people on the council? Is it the legal team? Is it the chief executive? Is it the cabinet? I, I am totally 100% sure that the information that will be released for the public domain will be anything other than what is already out there in the first place. And I think as stakeholders, majority stakeholders are the members of the public out there, they are the taxpayers that contribute all the money that was given to Peel over the years. And I think it's about time the truth comes out about everything that's been happening with Peel Holdings since their first acquisition of Teesside Airport. But I'll move the motion as it is read, uh, and obviously it's, it's going through, and it'll, I don't know what will happen, but I think there's more to be said about this, and I think there's more to come out, and I can't wait for that day. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Can we put the motion to the voter, please? All those in favour? Thank you, that is carried. Third motion, uh, moved by... Councillor Dr. Caroline Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I brought this motion out of frustration, really, at having to, uh, trying to deal with a situation on an estate in Gisborough where there's insufficient parking. The two years that I've been elected, I've been trying to sort this out. For 12 months, I've been promised a trial that's yet to start, and that's why I brought this motion. However, um, today um, I had a meeting with um, Michael Green um, and it was a successful meeting and I have every confidence that I'm no longer banging my head against the brick wall and my headache will soon abate. So at this time um, I do not wish to move um, this, this motion but should my headache re return Mr Green I will be moving the motion in future. Thank you. when the motion is withdrawn but I did have an important uh, an important statement to make in relation to that motion 
that I think the members of this chamber would want to hear, and I would have made that uh, in the uh, cabinet members' um, uh, 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 remarks earlier on, but I felt that the motion was going to deal with it. So I, I look for the approval of this chamber to make that announcement at this stage. while you are deliberating, it is up for this council to decide whether the motion can be withdrawn having been tabled. The mover of the motion has requested that we agree to that. Uh, I would agree to that having heard the explanation from the mover of the motion. <coughs> However, it is important that the motion having been tabled that members do have the opportunity to speak if they so choose. Therefore, I would be more than happy for Councillor Norton in particular to be able to comment. Can I ask Mr Newton to clarify the situation for us, please? Uh, yes, Mr Mayor. Um, if a motion has been moved, then there has to be a formal consent for it to be withdrawn. If the motion hasn't been moved, then it simply fails. So as Councillor Jackson has said, she's not moving the motion. Um, it, it's not on the table, effectively. I would challenge that guidance. Uh, first of all, we have an order paper. So, on that order paper, it lists certain motions. The motion has been accepted by the system for tabling and for members then to have the opportunity to discuss it. So, if the mover of any motion subsequently decides that because further information has become available, as the mover of this motion has described, then that, that is helpful to the mover of that motion. But it is tabled. Therefore, it is up to this chamber, not the monitoring officer, to decide whether the motion having been put is not debated or is allowed to be withdrawn. I suggest that having been tabled, Mr. Mayor, and at least one councillor wishing to comment that the motion should stay on the table until any member who wants to comment has had the opportunity of doing so. Putting in the document that we've received, uh, actually the verb is motion moved by Councillor Dr. C. Jackson, etc. So the verb there is moved. Uh, and if that, is, if that is not indicating that the motion has been moved here, but well, what is? So if, if the interpretation by Mr. Newton is, is uh, to be applied in the future, anything that appears on the order paper will have to say that the motion will be moved by Councillor X, Y, and Z. And we have to change the wording that we get here. But at the moment, it says it's been moved. There are two councillors three councillors now wishing to speak. This is a, this is a, a, a procedural matter. Can I, can I ask Mr. Newton to, to try and clarify it further, please? Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, my view is that the, the, the appearance of the motion on, on the agenda is to give no, notice that that motion is to be moved. It, it's, it's the physical act in the chamber of putting that forward that is the moving of the motion. So, um, you know, if Councillor Dr. Jackson hadn't appeared here today, there would have been no one to move the motion. It would have failed. I don't think the fact that she's here and doesn't move the motion makes any difference to that position. So my view is that um, notice has been given of the motion. Seconded.
by a councillor who is not present. Therefore, does the motion fail on that technicality? I'm sorry, I'll, I'm going to act on the, the advice that I've been given by our legal officer in a professional capacity, uh, so I'm not going to have any further debate on, on this particular matter. Thank you. Asking debate to debate anything, I simply want to make a statement in relation to an issue that affects this borough and that which each member of this chamber should be made aware of sooner rather than later, and the fact that it would have been given had that motion been debated, I do still look for that opportunity to present that statement. If it is a statement and not part of the debate, I will accept it, but uh, I am advised we cannot debate this motion. But Councillor Norton, if it is a statement you wish to give pertaining to not only this but to other schemes, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And, and, it, and it is a statement, uh, and, and, and I will respond to Councillor Jackson in full uh, at another opportunity. It's around parking around schools, which ever since I became uh, a member of the Council, and indeed uh, my short tenure so far in Cabinet, I don't think a week passes when I don't get some sort of email about the issue of parking around schools and those residents that live there and how they are uh, impacted. The task of the enforcement team is made hugely difficult given the number of schools, uh, Mr Mayor, that we have in the borough and all the parking regulations that surround them. And it's therefore impossible for them to logistically cover these schools uh, indeed sensibly. I see it as my responsibility and I want to inform this chamber that we as an authority have purchased a mobile CCTV unit, the sole purpose of which will be to monitor traffic uh, infringements and control around schools. Effectively then if you are infringing the traffic regulations and this vehicle passes it will automatically scan your number plate, take details from DVLA and issue you with an enforcement ticket which currently stands at about £70. So I'm hoping, Chair, that for this borough generally, come September when the new term starts, we are able to be more effective at the way we manage traffic management around our schools. It may not be popular with some, but I fear that uh, if we don't do something soon, then the safety of all those who operate uh, through our schools uh, is at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Norton. Uh, as I said, no, there's no debate. Sorry? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm told uh, a statement or a debate. I allowed Councillor Norton on the basis of Cabinet Member for Economic Growth. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Holyoke. Sorry. Uh, Right, can we pass on now? Thank you for making my first chairmanship of this committee so interesting. Um, can we move on to item 11, please, uh, to appoint members to any vacancies? I'm not aware that there are any vacancies for appointments to be made to. Um, can we therefore pass on to item 12? Questions from members of the Council. Uh, Councillor Nightingale, please. Uh, thank you again, Mr Mayor. Um, I didn't intend, to, didn't intend to speak so many times, but um, uh, um, in view of the widespread uh, protests and concern about the changes in committee timings uh, uh, and, and the speedy response, um, which of course indicates the level of discontent, um, I, I would, have, apart from the previous item we've just had, I would have been rather, um, I'm rather hesitant now to withdraw my question. So here goes the question. 
Um, will the leader of the council, uh, through Councillor Massey, please explain why the committee timetable was unilaterally changed without any consultation? Uh, thank you for the question. I think, as members will be aware, discussions have taken place informally over the last number of months about the fact that adults and children's, sorry, people's services, adults and children's services scrutiny, those two separate scrutinies, have very heavy agendas and take place on the same day. However, it was a complete oversight that any changes to the calendar were issued to members without consultation with the group leaders or with the wider membership. Um, I spoke immediately to Democratic Services and to our monitoring officer to express my concern about this, and I know a number of members on both sides of the chamber did. It wasn't appropriate considering people make diary arrangements months in advance around childcare, work, et cetera, et cetera, and I fully appreciate that. Um, so as I've said at the start of the meeting, and as you'll have received an email from Sue Fennick in Democratic Services, uh, the meetings will return to the previous diary arrangements, which were the year that we've just come out of, as opposed to the diary that you've got moving forward. So I would ask members to change the diary dates to reflect that if you have the hard copy, because you've been sent an e-copy which gives you the correct dates. Um, this was an oversight. It shouldn't have happened. It certainly shouldn't have happened without consultation, and I would like to see in future any such fundamental changes be consulted, at the very least with group leaders, but also through the established working group we had on governance, which I thought would have been a good venue for this, if possible. So you have my apologies, and it won't happen again, all being well. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Massey. Do you have a supplementary question, yep. Councillor Nightingale? Uh, we're all friends here, aren't we? So I'm not trying to apportion a portion blame at all. So, and I do thank the, uh, the uh, Deputy Leader of the Council to, uh, for uh, his, his reply. Um, and that he's, he's probably um, given one of the main reasons why people would be concerned about this. Members actually choose uh, their committees to, to sit on on the basis of their um, availability at a particular day, uh, and, and uh, in addition to their interests and, and so forth. So um, I think he has hit the nail on the head about why there was so much concern about this. So my supplementary, Mr. Mayor, is this. Um, uh, to, to, before I do with the supplementary, yes, I, the first I heard about this was, was, on, was on Monday, and, I, and I, I certainly was not involved in any discussion as, a, as the chairman of the Resources Committee. Uh, but my supplementary is this, Mr. Mayor, then. Will Councillor Massey, uh, in his role as the Cabinet Member for uh, Resources, guarantee that in future consultation will take place first before any decision is made and any circulation of any documents concerning the timetable for committees. I'd be very grateful if you would give us a yes or no answer to that one. And I think... We're delighted uh, at, at this news. Thank you, Councillor Nerting. Councillor Massey? Uh, Answers yes. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes our agenda. Can I thank you for your attendance and participation? <laughs>